Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Thank you for the promises you have given us. Because the word of God says, the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord will call. We're asking, Lord, tonight you open the heavens and you pour your spirit down upon your people in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, that the fullness will come to every life. Confirm your word in every life tonight, Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Here was the risen Lord speaking to his own disciples, children of God, those who were saved, and those he had prayed for that the Father will sanctify them. Now as they welcomed him, he was about to go, about to leave them, to go back to heaven. And he told them, a great commission was before them, a great assignment before them. And then he said, I'm sending the promise of the Father, my Father, upon you. But tarry, but wait, and wait for that spirit for that power. You keep on tarrying in that place, chosen place in Jerusalem until ye be endued, until ye be enveloped, until ye be saturated, until ye be immersed in the power from on high. As we talk and think, as we reflect and research and look at the word of God on this power of the promised Pentecost, you understand the breadth and the length, the height and the depth of this power. There are people that speak about the power of the Holy Ghost like you and I do. But they concentrate on speaking in tongues. There's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues. It's the, it's the evidence when he arrives, when he comes. But to understand, the emphasis of the Lord Jesus Christ is beyond tongues. And you shouldn't just say, because I speak in tongues, I've arrived. You look at the promised Pentecost. And you look at the evidence. And you look at what Jesus said, that experience will achieve in your life. Here he has, he has emphasized the power, the power to witness in the midst of opposition, in the midst of contradiction, the power, the staying power to abide there in spite of everything and still witness effectively. The power of the Holy Ghost is not limited to believers in the first century. The promise is to every believer, even today, true Pentecostal power is available for all of God's children today. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Here the word of God tells us that it's not just for that period, not just for that dispensation, not just for that era. It says the promise is unto you, those who are present there at that time. 
and ain't your children the people that will come after you. And then he says to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord a God shall call. Those who are far off and far away, away from them geographically, away from them culturally, away from them periodically. That is the period, the time. Like those of us who are living today, but far away from the time those people received the power, the power of the Holy Ghost. And we're here tonight understanding and believing that that power is available today. It will come to every one of us in Jesus' name. We need the power of the Spirit. Why? He will refresh us. We need the power of the Spirit. Why? He will quicken us, make us alive. Those who are weak, those who are fainting, those who are down, those who are discouraged, those who are stopping in the midway, the Holy Ghost comes and then it quickens you. We need the Holy Ghost. Why? He enlightens us. He shows us the light. He interprets the scriptures to us. He inspires us. He illuminates us. We need the Holy Ghost. Why? Because He teaches us. He will teach you and guide you into all the truth that I've revealed to you. What do we need? The Holy Ghost. He will reveal the Son, the Savior, the Sanctifier, the Healer, the Baptizer. Reveal him unto us. What do we need him? He edifies. He comes into our lives and he edifies us. We need him because he also searches and he convicts. When the Spirit of God is come, he will convict the world. First of all, he'll convict you. He'll convert you. He'll consecrate you. It will cleanse you. It will empower your life. And your life will become a convicting force anywhere you go. What do we need him? He heals. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in your mortal body, he that raised him from the dead, the Holy Ghost, it will also quicken your mortal body. Body. He intercedes, but we know not how to pray. But He, the Spirit of God, He makes the intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He comforts in all the situations of life. He says, I send the Comforter unto you, just like me, another Comforter. And when He comes, He'll comfort you. He helps us when the load is heavy to carry. And you cannot carry the load by yourself. He gives us help. Without Him, we'll be seriously limited and handicapped in life. Handicapped and limited in prayer. Handicapped and limited in ministry. But with Him, you go out and you minister. With him, you go out and you are productive. With him, you preach, you teach, you counsel, you pray, you run the race, you do the will of God in the power of the Spirit, the power, the preserving power of the promised Pentecost. Tonight is your night. You'll do it in Jesus' name. Three points we're going to consider. Number one, the prophetic anticipation of our Pentecost. The prophetic anticipation of our Pentecost. Number two, is the promised answer 
from his presence. He's going to go up to heaven. And he says he'll talk to the Father. He'll pray to the Father. And because he's in the presence of the Father, the Father will give answer to the prayer. We pray. He will give you the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Number three, the persuasive assurance of his power. When that power comes, when we're truly filled with the Holy Ghost, when we're truly immersed in the Holy Ghost, when we're truly baptized in the Holy Ghost, how do we know? How do you know in your life? As you continue living your life, as you continue ministering, how do you know that there is that assurance of His power? In your life, the persuasive assurance of his power. Number one, the prophetic anticipation of our Pentecost. Anticipation means that there were people in the Old Covenant. There were people in the Old Testament. They were looking ahead to the time. When the Holy Ghost in power will come upon the children of God, they predicted it, they prophesied it, they envisaged it, that that power of the Holy Ghost will come. Not just to select few, but for multitudes, of those who are following after the Lord. Something always happens. Something beyond yourself. Something supernatural. Something you never did before. Something that never happened before. Always happens at the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And then a the young man and told Moses and said, Elder that me that do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, Lord, my Lord Moses, forbid them. Here comes now the anticipation. Here comes the prophetic utterance. Here comes the expectation of the Pentecost in future, which was still to come. Verse 29, And Moses said unto him, and this thou for my sake, would God, that all the Lord's people were prophets. Would God, that all the Lord's people, all those who are saved, all those who are in the kingdom, all those who have believed in the Lord, are the children of God. Would God, how I wish, that's what he said, how I desire, that's what he said, that all of God's people were prophets, and that Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Anticipation, anticipation of that coming Pentecost. And now is the time that Moses was looking forward to, that all the people of God washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, saved and sanctified. It says, I wish, I desire, I want, I pray, I declare that the time will come when all of God's people will be filled, saturated, immersed, baptized, infused, endued, endowed with the Spirit of God. In Proverbs chapter 1, Verse 23, here is the Almighty God now talking through Solomon. The Almighty of God himself saying, the time is coming, both for those Jews and for the children of God, anywhere, everywhere. Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour. It wasn't done yet. It was something to come. It was something they should be expecting. It should be, it should be something they should be looking up to God for. 
Because he said, I will, a future promise, I will pour out my spirit unto you. And I will make known my words unto you. Can you see the evidence there? When I pour my spirit on you, I will make my words known unto you. Have you noticed in the Acts of the Apostles, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, all of a sudden, the veil was taken from their eyes. They just began to realize that this is that which Joel said. Peter, how did you know that the Spirit has come? I'll make my word known unto you. And then they called him. Did it we tell you not to speak in this name? By what authority have you done this? Immediately the word came. There's a sea. The stone that was left of you builders and has become the hedge of the corner. Everywhere they went, a challenge came. And the word of God came to them because of the residence of the Spirit of God. Here is the anticipation that the time will come. That when I pour my Spirit upon you, you will know the word. You'll know the meaning of the word. You'll know the interpretation of the word. And it was surprising to know many Old Testament passages they quoted. Every time they came into any conference, and then they were thinking, the Gentiles have come, and what are we going to do about this? The Holy Ghost took over. And then James said, this is what was said, known unto God, all his words from the foundation of the world. The, the Spirit of God, when it's resident in us, in the baptismal measure, it makes us to know the word. Isaiah chapter 44. Anticipation, looking forward to that time when the Spirit will come. Isaiah chapter 44, we're looking at verse 3. And I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Here is the condition now. Just understand how precious the Holy Spirit is. Just understand how indispensable the Holy Spirit is. Just understand that they will be limited in knowledge. Limited in refreshing, limited in renewal, limited in their ministry, limited in spiritual things. If the Holy Ghost is not present there and they're thirsty, they're thirsty. They're not thirsty for shaking. They're not thirsty just for speaking in tongues. They're thirsty for the fullness of the manifestation of the residence of the Spirit of God. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. Look at this. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. Can you see? I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and it's going to bring attendant blessing. The blessings of the word, the promises you never knew, you know them. The promises you could never claim, you'll be able to claim them. The places you have never gone, you'll be able to go there. And the exploits you have never done, you'll be able to do. When the Spirit of God comes in, it's not just that I'm shaking my hand, I'm shaking my head, I'm shaking my body. It's not just that I'm speaking. It's not, yes, it's not there. But the Spirit comes and I will pour my Spirit on you and then give you the blessings as well. Look at verse 4. And they shall spring up. As among the grass, as willows by the water courses, one shall say, I am the Lord's. It will be very easy to give your testimony anywhere. There will be no shame. There will be no fear. You rise up in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Holy Ghost, and you will be able to say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and so name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. There will be no confusion in your mind about religion. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, somebody may come and, you know, try to put some philosophy on you, some psychology on you, and some so-called spiritual revelation. 
and all the false prophets that come, you'll be able to say, here is he, he is the Lord, the only Lord, and you will understand the knowledge and the truth of the Almighty himself. When the Holy Ghost comes, it tells us in Ezekiel, chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, then will I speak of clean water upon you. The Lord had earlier promised in this chapter, I want to do better things for you. It's going beyond the time of the wilderness. Better things. It's going beyond the time of Canaan, when they occupied Canaan. Better things. It's going beyond the times of the kings and the times of the prophets. It says, I'm going to do better things unto you. And now he begins to tell us about the better things. You understand? Those children of Israel, they'll bring a sacrifice for atonement. The following year, they have to do that again, another sacrifice. They were never free from sin because they atoned for their sin. They were forgiven. After that forgiveness, they go back again. Then they need to bring another lamb for atonement the following year. But now he says, something better is coming because then, when that better thing comes, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. When God pronounces somebody clean, that fellow is clean. And ye shall be clean. And then he says, from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. You see what the Lord wants to do? It's not just that I'm shaking. It's not I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel, no, no. It says, I just want to purge and purify you and cleanse you. Every form of filthiness, everything is gone. And he said, from all your idols, the things that stand between you and God, the thing that you love beyond God, and the thing that hold your attention, hold your heart, he says, I'm going to cleanse you from all your idols, and a new heart will I put within you. He says, this is my promise. You know, it's not just religion. We come for the retreat. And then as we came at the entrance of the retreat, all the baggage we had, we go through the retreat, and then at the end, we're going out of the retreat, the same baggage is still there. It says, no, I'm going to make a transformation, a turning around in your heart. And it says, I'm going to give you a new heart also, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. It's telling us that this is what I plan. It's beyond religion. It's beyond tradition. It's, be, it's beyond doing it as usual. We did it before like this. We're doing it like that again. There's no change. It says there's going to be a change of heart. From the very inside, it turns you around. It turns your life around. And now it says in verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you. And I will put my spirit within you. And when you think about the believer, that the believer is forgiven, the believer is set free, and the Lord is saying that, number one, I will write my law in your heart. I will write my word in your heart. I'll put my expectation in your heart. I'll put the declaration not on the table of stone like all the Ten Commandments were written on stone. I'm going to put that law in your heart. Not only that, the spirit that will help you to be inside you. The law is inside your heart at sanctification. And then at the Holy Ghost baptism, the spirit of the Lord is inside your heart. And the spirit of God is giving you strength giving you understanding, giving you power, giving you conviction, giving you courage, because the Spirit is within you. That's what we're talking about, the power in the day you overcome, in the night you overcome. When you're all alone by yourself, he that is within you is greater than he that is in the world. Verse 27, and I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You see that evidence there? When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, 
When that Holy Ghost is within you, it's not just, you know, I shake, I wave my hand, I clap my hand. It's beyond that. It says, when the Spirit of God is there, I will cause you to do something. I will make you to do something. You will even not have an alternative. It will be something that you do because there's a propelling power inside you. That will make you do that. I'll make you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. It was still to be in the future. That's what I would call it anticipation. Anticipation. The prophetic anticipation of our Pentecost. We're looking at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. As we look at Joel chapter 2, again, we look at this prophetic anticipation it says in chapter 2 of joel verse 28 and it shall come to pass afterward it's saying this is future joel this is not your time joel this beyond your time it shall come to pass afterward some things will happen there will appear to be silence from heaven there will appear to be centuries between Malachi and Matthew when nothing is happening. But don't, get, don't lose hope. Something is still going to come after that period of silence. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's telling us that this is not limited to a denomination. This denomination, that denomination, that denomination. The people that believe in God, then this church, then that church, then that church. The people that believe in God, then the south, then the north, then the east, then the west. The people that believe in God, they are West Africa, they are in East Africa, they are in Southern Africa, and they are in North Africa. The people that believe in the Lord, they are in Africa, they are in America, they are in Europe, they are in Asia, everywhere. All flesh everywhere. It says there is no discrimination. The black and the white and the colored. It says that if you really believe on him, Afterward, afterward, this is the prophetic anticipation that he says, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. When that happens, how do we know that the spirit is now resident, that the spirit has now come? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters, they will not just be, you know, only singing crosses and clapping. Your sons and your daughters. They will not just be playing religious games. Your sons and your daughters, when the Holy Ghost comes, it, it turns the lives of the parents around and the children around and the sons and the daughters. They will prophesy. They will proclaim. They will know the value and the preciousness of the word of truth, of the word of God. And they take that out and they even declare to other people, your old men. They won't retire. Your old men, they won't sit back. Your old men will not be so dull and dead and dense that we are old now. Good old days when we were young. And we could have insight into the things of God. When the Holy Ghost comes, old men and old women, when the Holy Ghost comes, it says your old men shall dream dreams that it, what is that that is they'll say now at old age this is where i will get to that's a dream at the old age this is what i'm going to achieve for the kingdom of god and it is the holy ghost that paints that picture in their heart it's the holy ghost that brings that dream in their heart but look at many people today are they not baptized in the ghost that's what they say there's no vision, there's no, there's no dream, there's no goal, there's no ambition, there's no aspiration, there's nothing at all. There's only speaking in tongues, and you cannot see any dream. But it says when the Holy Ghost has come, anticipating Pentecost, it tells us that your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. 
the vision come over to Macedonia and help us. And when we saw that vision, we knew that the Holy Ghost, the Lord wanted us to be in that place and minister unto them. Look at the young men today. You know, their church, there are a lot of Pentecostal churches, but there's no vision. The vision of preaching out to the great beyond. And also upon my, upon my servants and upon my handmaids, in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Receive that anticipation. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 11. I indeed, here is John. This John, but you understand now, we're coming from Moses' anticipation. And then we get to the Proverbs Solomon anticipation. We come to Isaiah and he says, the time is coming. There's anticipation. We're looking forward to this. And we come to Ezekiel. There's that anticipation. We come to Joel. We come to that. And now we cross the 400 hundred years of silence. And we come to Matthew. At the time of John the Baptist has now arrived. And John continues that trend. He continues the chain of anticipation. And he's saying... The church is not going to be always like this. The people of God are not going to be as weak as this forever. He's saying something is going to happen. That's why he said, I indeed baptize you with, the, uh, with water to repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes are not worthy to bear. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Look at that. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Do you understand? In this anticipation, any time he says, I'll pour my spirit upon you, I'll put my spirit within you, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost, something else will happen. Something else will be added. And it says over here, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lukewarmness will vanish away. Lethargy will vanish away. Sleeping when we're hearing the word of God will vanish away. Coldness will vanish away. You'll be on fire. Look at a, a kettle that's on fire every time. And the fire is burning. Fire is burning. That kettle will be boiling. The water will be boiling every time. Anytime you get there because the water continues uh, uh, giving the heat. And the water keeps on boiling. And it says, it will baptize you. With the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, there will be no time you'll say, I don't know what's happening to me now. I feel so cold. I try to pray the way I used to pray. I can't. I try to go out and even force myself to go and preach the word. I can't. I try to witness and I can't. And I try to wake up a particular time in the night. It used to happen and I can't. He says, no, it will not happen. When the Holy Ghost comes and he says, in this anticipation, and he will baptize you of the Holy Ghost and then with fire, fervency will come into our lives. Somebody there said, fervency will come into our lives. Then he tells us in Acts chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verse 37. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they had heard this, they were preached in their hearts. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What had Peter told them? He said, This is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Ah, the time has come. The time of anticipation. We're anticipating that. We're waiting for that. And now the Christ that will save you, sanctify you, fill you with the Holy Ghost, and bring all the fulfillment of the Old Testament upon your life. You crucified him. Now you put him to death, but he rose again. But he's not here. He's gone to heaven. Again, the thirst and the desire rose up in them. Anticipation. 
Do you mean that those days of Moses can come back again? We can divide the Red Sea again? We can have the manna again? We can conquer those Canaanites again? Do you mean that the time of Joshua, when they went on in power and nothing ever conquered them, do you mean that time can come back again? Are you saying that the time of David, when he said he had the Spirit of God and he ruled by the Spirit of God, you mean that day can come back again? Are you telling us the time of Elijah and Elisha can come back again? Are you telling us that the prophecy of Ezekiel, that he said those dry bones will leave? Are you saying it will come back? That's our desire. What shall we do? What shall we do? Tell us what to do. And we want to be the fulfillment of that anticipation of Pentecost. Then he said, in verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive, and ye shall receive, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you. All those promises given in anticipation. He is coming. The promise is unto you. And to your children. Those are Jews now. And then to all that are far off. Those are Gentiles. The Gentiles who are far away. The Gentiles who are not circumcised. The Gentiles who have not gone through the system that they had gone through. The promise is unto you. The promise is to your children. And the promise is unto them. As many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise to Pentecost is coming. I said it's coming. But you see, there must be the thirst. There must be the earnestness. There must be the desire. There must be the exaltation of that Pentecost above every other thing. But if we are so cold and if we are so uh, ignorant, we do not know the value of that power. I was saying, okay, if there's time, we'll pray. Okay, if, uh, you know, if every other thing permits us, we'll wait upon the Lord. We don't understand what we're talking about. But today, what God has promised us, He'll fulfill in Jesus' name. I said what the Lord has promised us, He'll fulfill in Jesus' name. That promise, Pentecost, is not restricted to some people. Not restricted to a place. Not restricted to a period. From the time of Moses. And then Joshua. And then Samuel. And then David. And then Elijah. And then Elisha. And then Daniel. And the prophets. The fullness of the Spirit had been anticipated, desired, expected, and sought after. It's ours today. And as we seek by faith, He, the Holy Ghost, seeks to fill us more than we seek to receive Him. Point number two. The promised answer from His presence. The Lord assures us, in fact, from the time of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 10, Reading from verse 1, Zechariah chapter 10, reading from verse 1, that this answer will come from the presence of the Lord. But it says, ask, ask ye of the Lord, rain, in the time of the latter rain. That's the language used for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They are pouring of the Spirit of God. It's like rain from heaven. Latter rain, because it's at the latter time. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. It says, it's the time, the prophesied time. It's the time, the appointed time. It is the time of the latter rain. And yet, we must ask. Many people will try to argue logically. But sometimes, logic will fail. What's the logic? If it's the time of the latter rain, we don't have to do anything about it. It's the latter rain, and this is the time, this is the period, it will come. It says afterward, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And since it said afterward, and this is the afterward, this is the period of the latter rain, he will do it. No, tarry, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endured with power from on high. 
it says, ask ye. That chapter 10, verse 1. Ask of the Lord. You're asking the Lord. You're not asking man. The people that are going to people, lay hands on me. Do this for me. Give me the Holy Ghost. No man cannot give you the Holy Ghost. It's God himself that will give you the Holy Ghost. And it says, ask of the Lord in the time of the latter rain, so that the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. And every one grass in the field, every one grass in the field, it says, is for everyone. It will come upon your life. I said it will come upon your life. Luke chapter 11, the promised answer from his presence. Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, and I say unto you, don't transpire to other people, and I say unto you, you deserve this blessing of God. You deserve this enrichment of the Spirit. You deserve this endowment of power. You desire this enveloping of power. It says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. If we ask in the right way, if we ask, having entered into the kingdom through the gate of salvation, if we ask, and we're proceeded through the door of sanctification. And then we now come into the Holy of Holies. We come into the inner chamber. We come where the servants of God come. Sinner, the sinner cannot jump and just get into the Holy of Holies and have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The sinner will come through the gate. Atonement is made. It will come through the gate. Redemption is given. He comes through the gate, the sins are forgiven. And then, after he comes out of that altar court, he comes to the holy place, looking at the temple, arrangement of the children of Israel. And in that holy place now, he's sanctified, he's made holy, and he lays his heart, his life on the altar. But then there's a veil that is still there that encloses the holy of holies. And that veil was torn when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And he goes through that veil. He saved. He came through the gate. He sanctified. He came through the door. And now he enters the holy of holies. And then he was the Shekinah glory of God that was not seen outside there to come upon him. And if he knocks at that time, if he knocks at that door, it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And then he goes on to give his observation, then he comes to conclusion in verse 13. If ye then be evil natural people, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that do what? Tell me out loud. You understand that sometimes the natural illustration will stop and the spiritual illustration will take over. The natural illustration, you give good things to your children. And sometimes they don't have to ask. A child does not have to ask and plead and beg and consecrate before having breakfast food. A child does not have to ask and ask and ask before having school fees. A child does not have to ask and ask and knock and knock before the father will say that you need to be clothed and buy the clothes. But now, when it comes to the spiritual side, the Lord is saying, now I'm giving you that just for you to understand, the willingness of the Lord as the willingness of a parent to bless the child, but now spiritually, you must ask. You must ask, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? We're looking at um, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. It says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, And behold, 
I sent the promise of my father upon you. Oh, we can relax then because he is Christ. He cannot fail. He has said, I will send. He knows the time. He knows what he will do. No, in spiritual matters, we don't do it like that. That's lukewarmness. That's lethargy. That's coldness. That's ignorance of the way God works. Even though he said, behold, I sent the promise of my father upon you. He said, but tarry ye. I about salvation. Jesus prayed, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Were they all saved because of that? No. That's why in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, they said, what shall we do? He had prayed for them, forgive them. They know not what to do. They still have to pray. They still have to repent. And the same thing with the sinners who are there today. The Jesus Christ has paid the price and he has given his life so that whosoever shall call, they still have to call, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They still have to call to be saved. Sanctification. Because it's prayed for us, sanctify them through thy truth. That word is truth. Okay, Christ has prayed for me, sanctify them. But you know what it says? It says, Jesus therefore, that he might sanctify the people, he suffered without the gate, let us go out therefore. And then as we go out, then we ask him and we plead with him. And he sanctifies us. In spiritual things, we don't fold our hands. We don't just sit back and say, he said, I will send the spirit of my father upon you. If he said he'll do it, let him do it. You will ask. You will tarry. It says, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured. Now when you are praying, you might feel some heat, keep on praying. You might feel some freshness, keep on praying. You might feel some energy, keep on praying. You might feel that I feel different, I feel different until, 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 until you've been dealt with power from on high. Until when the power from heaven will come upon your soul. When the power from heaven will come upon your spirit. When the power from heaven will endure you, will overshadow you, will saturate you. And you will know that you know that the power is there. And you can face any challenge. And you can go anywhere. And you will preach the word of God. And you will know the power is there. That you become unstoppable. You become unconquerable. You become unbeatable. Until that power comes upon your life. That's what he's saying. It's not just that, you know, I prayed and I feel a little excitement. I pray and I feel a little refreshing. I pray and I feel a little comfort. I pray and I feel a little peace. I pray and I feel a little thing. No. Until, until, until you be endured with power from on high, it will do it in Jesus' name. I said it will do it in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And, and you understand the purpose why I want to do this. You understand the purpose why I want to give this. It says in John chapter 14, verse 12. Very late, very late, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. Think about that. The vision. The dream. The goal. The end result. He that believeth in me. I'm sure you understand. It's not talking about salvation. He believeth on me. He is saved already. Can you tell me that saved people, they do the works that he has done? No. Not yet. He that believeth in me, I believe him is my sanctifier. Sanctifier, that's personal. He sanctifies you. He purifies you. He circumcises your heart. It's all for you and within you. Salvation, your own sins are forgiven. It's personal. Salvation, you are now able to live the Christian life victoriously, personal. And that one doesn't really touch another person. And then sanctification, the purity of heart, again it is still personal. 
the one that makes you stretch your hand of victory to the outsider. The one that makes you stretch your hand of transformation to the outsider is the power of the Holy Ghost. He shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. The salvation is great. Preparation ground. Sanctification is wonderful. It's preparation ground. But now those who want to touch their community. They want to touch their country. They want to touch people around them. He that believeth on me. The works that I do he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my father. How will that happen? Look at verse 17. Even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive. Because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you. Think about that. You are saved. He dwelleth with you. You are sanctified. He dwelleth with you. Now the next stage. And shall be in you. Holy Ghost baptism. Already you are saved, already you are sanctified, and it dwelleth with you. But now you move on. You see, there are many people, they don't understand the difference between the presence of the Spirit, it dwelleth with you. And then the power and the prominence of the Spirit, it shall be in you. That's what the Lord wants to do. And that is what he's going to do. He'll do it in your life in Jesus' name. I said he'll do it in your life in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4. I mean, assembled together with them. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Wait. For the promise of the Father. Once again, you understand the difference between our, you know, human life and the spiritual side. Somebody promised you something. And as he promised you, I give you this. I'm going out and I'm going to get it for you. You keep on doing whatever you're doing. You don't have to think about it. If he's faithful, he's going to do that. You don't need to wait, stop every other thing, stop every other assignment, and we'll say, what are you waiting for there? You're not doing anything. Somebody promised me, and he's gone to the place, he's going to get something for me, and I'm waiting, why don't you get other things done? That's human life, that's human nature. But in this case now, Jesus said, I'm sending this upon you, but wait, this is spiritual. I want to see that you are eager. I want to see you are thirsty. I want to see you are hungry. I want to see you are passionate about this. It says, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me, for John truly really baptized with water. But he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, but he shall receive power. He shall receive power. Power. I thought he told them in Luke chapter 10. Behold, I give unto you power. And ye shall tread on serpents and scorpions. That's personal. That's personal. In your personal life. To have the victory, you will tread on serpents and scorpions. Personal. And then over all the power of the enemy, of your enemy, the courage to stand, still personal. And nothing shall by any means overcome you or conquer you. That's still personal. Now we're talking about the power of outreach. The power of touching other lives. The power of going to the great beyond. The power of moving from region to um, whatever zone and all that in the world. And the power to go to another culture and then go to subdue that for the Lord. That, that's beyond personal now. That is talking about your evangelistic outreach. Because it says you shall receive power. 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. It says, before that power comes, because of your limitation, you'll say, finish one, before you go to number two. Finish number two, before you go to number three. There's so many unbelievers there in Jerusalem. Finish that before you go to Judea. And then before you go to Samaria, where your power is limited, that's how you manage yourself. But now it says you're going to have this unlimited power. And then it says at the same time, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the most part of the earth, you are here, you are there. You are there, you are over there. And you are making way this way and you are going that direction. Why? Because you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem at the same time simultaneously. And in all Judea and in Samaria. And the angel of the uttermost part of the earth. And then he tells us, look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, you receive. He gives, and then you receive. You receive in Jesus' name. And you know there are people that teach other people. And they don't understand. They're limited in their understanding of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They think... Baptism in the Holy Ghost is equal to speaking in tongues, full stop, period. And so, they teach them, okay, now don't speak your language, don't speak your language, close your eyes, and then, uh, you know, they, they try to repeat what I'm saying, and then they speak in tongues, repeat, repeat, and then they repeat, make it fast, make it fast, make, that's it, that's it, you've got it. No, you know, when a child is born, and you put the bottle of milk in the mouth of that child. There's no lecture. There's no teaching. How that child will suck the milk. Either directly from the mother or from the bottle. You receive. That's it. The nature is in you. Already, when you are saved, except you are born of water and of the spirit, the spirit abides with you. When you are sanctified, the Spirit abides. And now there is a magnet within, a, a moderate magnet, the Holy Spirit. And then there's a mighty force, a mighty deluge, a mighty flood of the Spirit coming in. Deep speaketh unto deep. And because of what is resident in you already, what is present with your life already, this one that is coming, that wants to take over, you receive. Nobody to lecture you. Nobody to say, speak this after me. Speak that after me. Or talk faster, talk faster, talk faster. You shall receive. You are receiving Jesus' name. And then he tells us in Acts of the Apostle chapter 1 verse 14. Verse 14. These are continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. These all continued. In prayer and supplication for the women and bearing the mother of Jesus with his brethren. Chapter 4, we're reading from verse 31. Chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all, how many of them? I said, how many of them? And they were all filled of the Holy Ghost. And they speak the word. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And something happened. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what they couldn't do before. They had done it partially. But now they came out in full force. They came out in full power. They came out in full courage. They came out irresistible. And it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they speak the word of God with boldness. That's what it does when it comes. When the Holy Ghost power comes. And it says in verse 33, our great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, 
and great grace was upon them all. They had grace before, but now the Holy Ghost came in, great grace was upon them all. The outpouring of the Spirit, it will happen. The baptism in the Spirit, it will happen. The endowment of power from on high, it will happen. The provision of Jesus as Savior, as Sanctifier. The privilege of every child of God. Tarry and pray, ask, seek and knock, desire, hunger, thirst, accept, believe, expect, consecrate, obtain and receive by faith. Point number three. The persuasive assurance of his power. The persuasive assurance of his power. When somebody has the presence, the power, the prominence, the preeminence of the Holy Ghost in his life, how do we know? Somebody says, but speaking in tongues, Partially true. The ass of Balaam spoke in tongues. Real language. And Balaam understood. Balaam spoke back. He, the ass understood. The ass spoke back again. And he moved saw an angel. But that's not baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because that did not continue for the ass to use that, that language, to go and preach to other people, and then to be so saturated with the Holy Ghost, is moving from place to place, and it's no more like an ordinary ass like all the other people. This one makes you extraordinary, makes you different. This one makes you distinct. This one makes you courageous. This one makes you to go out and be an agent of conversion in the lives of people around you. This one makes you bold. This one makes you irresistible. This one makes you to have the vision that no fire or persecution can quench. This one gives you that vision and that dream that as you are getting old, older and older, as your days are so shall your strength be. That's what we're talking about. What then is the persuasive assurance of his power? We're looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34. I thought somebody said the Old Testament people were not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, yes and no. You need to understand the Old Testament people generally were not raptured. They were not caught away to heaven. But Enoch had that experience, the rapture. He walked by faith with God. And it was not because God took him. What was still anticipating, it happened unto Enoch. Do you know, Elisha, the Lord will take your master from your head today. That's rapture. It happened to Elijah at that time. And people even expected it to happen to him, even though it wasn't general with everybody. I, Elijah said, go tell your master Obadiah that I, Elijah, I am here. And he said, what have I done? You want Ahab to kill me? He'll be searching for you. As I go now, the Spirit of God will transport you from there and take you to a place we cannot tell. They knew that there were people in the old covenant that went beyond their period and dispensation and they got what other people did not get. The sense of the power of the Holy Ghost. There were people in the Old Testament era they got it and they showed the evidence. If they got it at that time, before the time of the outpouring of the power at this time of the latter rain, it will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Full of the spirit of wisdom. Full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. 
and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. You can see the evidence was there. You didn't have to say, was uh, Moses filled with the Spirit, energized by the Spirit, endued with the Spirit, endowed by the Spirit? Did Moses have the gifts of the Spirit? You don't have to ask. Everybody knows he had. And the assurance was there, a persuasive assurance. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 9. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, and it came to pass when they had gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. It depends on your desire, on your aspiration, on your ambition, on the value you put on the Holy Spirit. It depends on whatever it is so you put as number one. Look at Elisha. He could have asked Elijah any, about any other thing, about all the revelation he's got, about what the Lord told him. What should be my attitude to Ahab? What should be my attitude to Ahab if Ahab was dead? But all the people that followed Ahab and Jezebel, what should be my attitude? He said, I'm asking for one thing. Let your double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, that was as a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, you see that condition? If not, you see that? conditional promise and if not but if not it shall not be so and it came to pass and it still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and all seas of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by one wind into heaven where did Elijah go I said, where did Elijah go? I said, rapture. He went to heaven. Got the rapture before his time. And Elijah saw it. And he cried, my father, my father. The chariot of Israel. And the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes. And rent them, tore them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah. That fell up from him. And went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters. And said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had so smitten also, at smitten the waters, departed hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And Elisha went over. You'll go over. I said you'll go over if you have that desire like he had, that thirst like he had, that hunger like he had, that passion that he had, like asking like he did. Then look at the evidence now. Something happens in our lives that people can tell according to scripture that you have got the evidence of the Holy Ghost in your life. It's not just a private thing, a private uh, a gift to speak in it. That's private. That's for your prayer life. And it says over here now, something has happened that everybody in the public could see. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him, it will happen. I'm coming to John, New Testament now. As we come to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 26. 
John chapter 15, verse 26, verse 27. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth that proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. When somebody has received the Holy Ghost, is the Spirit of truth. And you will know that you have got the spirit of truth because any error, it might be 90% truth plus 10% error, falsehood, you'll detect, you will know. You see, there's error there. There's a drop of poison in that bottle of water. That's the evidence because you wouldn't know ordinarily. But the Holy Ghost has come upon you and it's the spirit of truth. And he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16, Acts, chapter, uh, John chapter 16. Reading from verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. How do you know that the Spirit has come? Is the Comforter. You know, something happens to you and, you know, the Comforter is sure that there, if you are baptized, the Holy Ghost to comfort you, to explain to you, all things work together for good. For them that love God, to them that love God, and to them that are called by His name. But something happens, there's confusion. You're speaking in tongues, there's confusion. Something happens, you cannot tell. There's a crossroad. You don't know the way to take. There's oppression. There's difficulty. There's danger. And then you're running here and there. I'm waiting for counseling. I'm waiting for counseling. When he's come, he will comfort you. And you will not be kind of drowning yourself in the tears of self-pity. It says, it will but. If I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Your life will convict people of their sins. Even before you open your mouth. Because the presence of the Holy Spirit there, they see you. They just remember they are not right in the sight of the Lord. And of righteousness and of judgment and of sin. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things, I have yet many things to say unto you, but she cannot bear them now. Sage, and they call him Master and Lord, and I have many things I will say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But when that spirit is calm, what you could not bear before, you will bear what you could not endure before. You will endure what you couldn't understand before. You understand? That's the evidence, the persuasive evidence that we know. The assurance, the power, the presence of the Spirit is there. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come? He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. You see, the truth of eschatology, the truth of things to come, the truth to be able to divine line upon line, precept upon precept, he will guide you into all truth. Look at this, and he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. And that's the abiding evidence that is there. We're looking at um, ch chapter 14 of John. Chapter 14 of John. We're looking at verse 26 for the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Look at this. He shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. Can you do your quiet time without any help of notes? And just open the word and read that passage. And then it begins to bring out salient points. 
useful points, profitable points unto you. Because he is the author of the scriptures and he resides in you. And he knows the application to your life. He'll teach you all things. Look at this. And bring all things to your remembrance. When the Holy Ghost comes, you remember. The words are spoken unto you. Whatsoever I have spoken unto you. Do you remember? Ananias and Sapphira. It came Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, from verse 1, with a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, with his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? To the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price. How do we know that? That's because they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh -uh. Judas Iscariot was with them three and a half years. He held the bag, he was stealing from the bag. None of them knew. He didn't know he was a thief. But to look at this now. Ananas and Sapphira, they came. Times have changed. A new experience had now come. The Holy Ghost had endured them. The Holy Ghost had filled them. And he will show you, show you things. And as they came, and he said, and Peter said, is this all? Yes, that's all. How has Satan filled your heart? Revelation is a spirit of revelation. And that's why, as we come today, we're expecting, uh, and the Lord will do it. I said, the Lord will do it. Already, I said, 30 years there, in the city of Jerusalem, which you be in deal with power from on high. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 1, verse 8 again, but he shall receive power. Anybody there? I said, anybody there? Anybody there? Tired people, tired people. Or people who are awake and excited, are you there? You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, unto Christ, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. They received. How do we know they received? Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They got it, I'll get it. They received it, I'll receive it. And they experienced it, you'll experience it in Jesus' name. Pentecost, still the same today, signifies power, signifies passion signifies perception, leads us and drives us into preaching. It makes us to have persuasion. It drives us to perseverance. It moves us to prayer. It gives us progress. It reproduces the life and the ministry of Christ in us. And as you see all this, the question now comes to you. In Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Look at all these things we have said. Apart from speaking in tongues, push that aside now. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Today can be the day of that power. The day of that prayer and the day of that perception and the day of persuasive evidence and assurance in our lives, the power is available. The promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. 
We're going to rise up and we're going to talk to the Lord in prayer. What value do you put on the Holy Ghost? Or priority do you have seeking the Holy Ghost? What thirst do you have discerning the Holy Ghost? Pray and let Him come upon your life.